Good morning, everyone. Just let me start my message to you this morning, my short message with a, a short story about my life. Because for times in my life, I've, bit, have, I've really suffered from a lack of hope. I've had times in my life where I've lacked resources. It's never been really bad, but I've not had what I would have liked. I've always had good relationships, things that have helped me, people who've helped me, my family, my friends to keep me going. But the issue that I've had through so much of my life has been a lack of purpose, a lack of destiny, a lack of direction, a lack of hope. Well, to be more clear, deep down, I knew there was something there, but I wasn't sure how to get to it. I knew what I was supposed to be doing. I knew what I was put on this planet for, but I just didn't quite know how to get there. It's like it just needed breaking open. And what's more, it's like accessing it was... It felt like taking the long way round, almost like taking the long way round to get from Lincoln to Hull rather than do the sensible thing, to pay the toll to get across the Humber. And I wasn't sure that I was willing to pay the price that it would cost. And that's why I was living in hopelessness. I guess a lot of us at the moment are feeling a hopelessness, a weariness with COVID, a belief maybe that things will never get back to the way we'd like them to be. Will they? I believe so, but at times we can despair, can't we? We're not the only people in history to feel like this. No, no. While I wouldn't want to detract from what we're going through right now, the difficulties that we're facing, there are people in our nation and people in other countries around the world who are going through a much worse situation at the minute. This pandemic is hitting them far harder. And many people throughout history have gone through situations like ours that are far tougher. It makes me think of my grandparents, my mum's parents. Do you know what? They were so tough. Nothing fazed them. Even when it looked like they might struggle through something, they just had this steel about them. They were made of iron. They went through World War II as youngsters. And they came out, like so many of their generation, out of the other side, just made of just unbreakable stuff. They were the unbreakable generation. Nothing fazed them, not, no matter what they went through. But what unites them and what unites us, and in, indeed every person who's ever lived on planet Earth, is that we're all human and we all need a purpose in life. We feel things we love, we hate, we laugh, we cry, we rejoice, we mourn. And like so many others, we go through times of difficulty and struggle and a lack of hope. And once upon a time, in a little-known part of the Middle East, there was a group of people, a sizable group of people, who were in a pretty dark time. And I'm going to tell you a snapshot of their story right now. Nevertheless, that time of darkness and despair will not go on forever, they said. The lack, the land of Zebulun and Naphtali will be humbled, but there will be a time in the future when that Galilee of the Gentiles, which lies along the road that runs between the Jordan and the sea, will be filled with glory. Because the people who walk in darkness will see a great light. For those who live in a land of deep darkness, a light will shine. You will enlarge the nation of Israel and its people will rejoice. They will rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest and like warriors dividing the plunder. For you will break the yoke of their slavery and lift the heavy burden from their shoulders. You will break the oppressor's rod, just as you did when you destroyed the army of Midian. The boots of the warrior and the uniforms bloodstained by war will all be burned. They will be fueled for the fire. For unto us a child is born and a son is given to us. The government will rest on his shoulders and he will be called Wonderful God, Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father and Prince of Peace. His government and, his, and its peace will never end. He will rule with fairness and justice from the throne of his ancestor David for all eternity. The passionate commitment of the lords of heaven's armies will make this happen. What is that? all of that about? There were these people and the land, the nation of Israel, they were going through a time of utter hopelessness. What was this? And who were these people. Well, these people, there's a clue in verse 1, but also in a chapter earlier. I've just read to you from the very start of Isaiah chapter 9, and there's a clue in, cha in chapter 8, because it says these people, this is a prophecy that these people, Israel, are going to be invaded, invaded by the Assyrian 
army, and that this would bring deep and dark distress on the land. And I read that recently, and I thought, wow, you know, we can feel like the situations we're in in our lives at the minute, with this pandemic, with other areas of our lives, they can feel like invading armies, and it can feel like it plunges us into this deep darkness, just like the deep darkness that was on that land there. Sometimes, certain things that come into our lives can feel like that invading army. And it's like our lives are that, like that land, and we don't want it there. We want to get rid of it, but sometimes we don't know how, or sometimes we can't. This thing that I've just read to you, this piece from the Bible, talks, however, about while there is going to be this deep distress in the land, there is also a hope as well. And it says, a light will dawn on this land just like the dawn of a new morning. Think for a moment about darkness. It's easy to at this time of year because the days go by so quickly, don't they? Because we, we're at that time of the year when we have very, very short days and very long nights. Darkness, I don't believe, is really a thing in itself. Darkness is just the absence of light. It's darkness, so it's, it's, worth, it's the absence of something better. There, at times, you know, it seems like, wow, there's a, deep, a number of deep shadows over our land, just as these people had then. These people experienced times of real wickedness, real trouble. And just like us, they knew difficulty and trouble and problems. There was a real lack of values in the time in which they lived. But change was coming. It wasn't always going to be like that. Have you ever woken up in the night and just lain in the darkness and just thought, is morning ever going to come? I actually lay awake for about an hour last night, just could not get back to sleep, and I was just overwhelmed by how dark it was in my bedroom, how dark it was outside, this darkness over the land. But I knew that the light of the dawn was coming because these people, like we can sometimes, felt so lost but they were told in this prophecy it will not be like this forever change is coming hope is coming a light is coming and it's better than a street lamp to guide you on your way home at light at, at night because this light wasn't just an illumination of the world but a light that would come and would save and would change all things that light was a person in fact, the light promised was the birth of Jesus Christ. To us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. These passages are a prophecy of his birth, of his coming to earth. And his birth, Jesus the light, he wasn't a 20-watt bulb that might give a little bit of light. He was a great light who would light up the whole earth, the whole of humanity. Jesus, years later, quoted when he, was, when he walked on earth, he actually quoted part of what I've read to you this morning to show the completion of that prophecy. It's, you can find it in Matthew 4. Jesus quotes it because to show that it's been finished. Just as it was first written, he's come to complete it. He also said this, he said, I, I really am this light that was prophesied. He said, I am the light of the world, and if you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness, because you will have the light that leads to life. And he also said that people who follow him, and this is a challenge to those of us who do follow him this morning, he says, you are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on the stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see, so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. For unto us a child is born and a son is given. He is a gift at the time of the year when we give gifts. He is a gift given for our benefit. God to come and be with us forever and be for us forever. But what else was he? Well, the, what I've just read to you tells us he was four things. I think there's many other things that he is as well, but it concentrates on four things. He's multifaceted. Firstly, he's the wonderful counsellor. You've got two important words there. The word wonderful 
means that whatever follows on from it is truly incredible. You don't describe something as wonderful and then describe something badly. Wonderful something, in this case, wonderful counselor. It means truly great, truly awesome. It literally means he will have the wonder of a counselor. He's literally a supernatural counselor, a person who you can go to any time of the day or night, and you can receive unearthly, godly, heavenly wisdom and solutions for the things that you are going through in your life. I've seen a counsellor before. I don't know if you ever have a a Christian counsellor or a secular counsellor, and they can be really great at giving you help and wisdom and tips, but Jesus is greater than that. He's a wonderful counsellor with the wonder of heaven in his mind that he can communicate to you and help you through things. He's also mighty God. This might seem strange because you... The word mighty, it means like strong, it means powerful. You might think about a mighty warrior with a sword in his hand. But this vulnerable infant, how is he mighty? There's nothing much more vulnerable than a newborn baby. They need taking care of, they can't take care of themselves. It takes a a child then becoming an adult years to learn how to be strong and mighty, how to take care of themselves. And yet he was mighty despite that human frailty. The infant there is not just fully human, but he's fully God as well. He's God and man. In fact, if you'll go with me with the joke, you could say he is God con carne. (laughs) The infant in the manger is also the mighty, all-present and powerful God who is there at the dawn of creation, the supreme one. Just thinking about this time of, of history, the world needed a hero. It's like that Bonnie Tyler song. The world was crying out for a hero, and here came one. He was a wonderful counselor. He was mighty God. He's also everlasting father. What does that mean, and what is that not? It literally means he was the father of, the, of eternity. So he's got no beginning. He's got no end. He's just always there. The light is always on. Isaiah, you should know, is not saying that Jesus is Father God, but he's saying that this baby king will be like a father to the the earthly people. He'll be loving, tender, compassionate, an all-wise instructor, a trainer, a provider, just like any great dad would want to be for his children. My dad was the best dad I could have imagined having, despite his flaws. And he was a wonderful father, but this father, Jesus, will be an everlasting father. He will outlast everyone. And I believe if you don't have an earthly father, he can be a father to you, just as he can be if you do have one. If you've had a rubbish dad or have a dad who's not great, he can still be a father to you, because he wants to be a father to the fatherless, because he's everlasting father. Finally, he's prince of peace as well. And what is peace itself? Peace, you could say it's an absence of war. It's when times are good and amicable. And not only is Jesus peace, it says he's the prince of peace. A prince is a leader, a commander, a ruler. He's like the captain of peace. So if peace is a person, that person will be Jesus. The Bible also says that Jesus isn't just the prince of peace. It says that he is our peace. He has come to give us peace, to be peace to us. In a world of trouble and a world of anxiety, you know, it breaks my heart to see so many people suffering times like this and at other times with fear and anxiety and worry. Jesus says, come to me and I will give you peace. You can lay all your burdens on my shoulders and if you will only come to me, I will give you peace. There are two levels in which Jesus came to give peace. He came to give peace between God and people, but he also came to bring true and lasting peace on earth. And that's what we think and think about this time of the year. There's so many great stories of even wars, temporarily at least, coming to an end at Christmas. Peace on earth and goodwill to everyone. 
The last real bit that it says about Jesus here is that he will establish government and accomplish it by his zeal and his passion. And this made me think about our universe. Our universe is always expanding. And it's really similar here because we can be carriers of the kingdom here, here on earth. And when Jesus comes back, as he will do at the end of time here on earth... He will not only come back to reign, he will come back to replace every government and to set up his government on earth. I imagine that when Jesus comes, and I mean no disrespect to any politician who has been, is currently, or will ever be, but do you know what? When Jesus comes, he will go to Whitehall, and he will go to the White House, and he will go to every single government on earth, and he will replace those leaders, and he will say, now I'm setting up my government. Let me show you how good government really works. I'm talking to you now as I wrap up about someone who can be trusted more than anyone else. Many people struggle to trust God, And I say to them, well, do you know what? If you can trust people, you can trust him because he'll never let you down. This Jesus gives us an invitation today because he didn't just come to these people all the 2,000 years ago to be wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father and prince of peace. Not just to them, he came to be it for you if you'd like him to be. If he is already in your life, then that's great. But if you don't, he came with such a passion and a zeal and desire to know you and he wants to know you today and the great thing is you don't have to have it all figured out you don't have to know where your life is headed exactly all you have to know is Jesus is for you would never hurt you that he's completely trustworthy and that he wants to know you and he even died for your sins prior to you ever knowing ever being born ever being thought of ever being knowing who he is just so you had that opportunity. And it's one that stands in front of every single one of us. And he says, if you will trust me, I'll save save you and I will be with you forever and it will be glorious. And through all the trials and troubles and tribulations of life, I will never, ever, ever abandon you or leave you or forsake you. All you have to do is say, okay, God, I don't want to live my life without you anymore. I'm just going to trust you. I'm going to take you at your word, and I'm going to trust you. If you already do, if I'm preaching to the choir this morning, if you're in that choir, can I encourage you to trust him more this Christmas? Can you go through these attributes of who he is and live like them, by them, and for them? Can you know him more this Christmas? Can this be the Christmas when, whether you know him or not, where everything changes because you kind of put all the stuff, all the commercialism to one side and you said, in this year where we've been tested far more than we ever thought we would be, I'm going to trust Jesus this year. Can this be the Christmas where everything changes? Returning to the story I started with before I pray. I once was lost and now I'm found. And that can be you as well. There's nothing special about me other than the fact that Jesus may be special. And I encourage you this morning to put your trust in him. And I'm going to pray a prayer right now, and it'll appear on our screen. If you've never prayed this prayer before, I'd encourage you to, to pray it, and then to get in touch with us. Get, get in touch with us, drop us an email, give us a call, visit our website, and connect with us, or drop your name in the comments. We'd love to hear from you. Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner, and I just ask right now for your forgiveness. I believe you died for my sins and rose from the dead, and I turn from my sins and invite you to come into my heart and life. I want to trust and follow you as my Lord and Saviour.